Hello, um, my name is Robert Jenkins and I'm the Global Chief of Education in UNICEF and I'm very pleased to be with you all and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm gonna be presenting um, uh, the issues related to COVID and how it has affected and disrupted schools and zeroing in specifically on school reopening. The impact of COVID-19 on education can be put into three buckets. For one, it has compounded the already uh, global learning crisis. The world was experiencing a global learning crisis before the pandemic with far too many children. For example, 53% of 10 year olds in low and middle income countries not being able to read with understanding. Um, so the world was experiencing a global learning crisis prior to the pandemic and then with the mass school closures, which at the height of the uh, school closures, 1.6 billion students uh, had their learning disrupted. That's over 90% of the global student uh, body. And so uh, student population, sorry. So we are, comp this disruption caused by COVID-19 has compounded the learning crisis. Secondly, the most marginalized have been affected the most. 463 million children, about a third of the children globally, um, have never been reached during this period with remote learning. And that's remote learning in all its forms, the radio, the television, or IT enabled uh, tools. And so while 90% of countries implemented some form of remote learning, indeed, many, many children have missed out on the remote learning opportunities due to their marginalization and vulnerability. And we are very concerned and increasingly concerned about the shock on education budgets that COVID um, is having. Governments, understandably, are likely to prioritize health and social protection expenditures but also with the decline in household income and reduc a reduction in investments in education, but also um, donors and international assistance will be coming under increasing pressure. So we have th these three broad impacts of COVID-19 on education. Let me just zero in on um, what happens with the school closures and how learning is put at risk. At the end of September, two thirds of countries were either fully or partially reopening their schools. And that means a third of the uh, country still had schools closed. To date, still 577 million learners in 34 countries, it's about one in three, as I mentioned, learning continues to be affected. UNICEF data from 142 countries shows that almost Every country did include some form of distance learning in their education response. And distance learning, again, could be the whole range of technology. In most countries, about 88% of them had at least one measure to increase connectivity to online learning. And we feel that's very, very important because with online learning, of course, you have greater um, quality. As I mentioned before, we have different uh, children were affected differently by this pandemic and their learning. And you'll see from this gra graph, um, it's by a uh, cycle of their education. So from pre-primary to the green represents tertiary, separated by males and females. And you'll see the percentage of uh, children that were at risk um, of dropping out is in the in the dots. And you can see it's quite significant um, as the younger ages and the oldest ages, and then a difference also by gender. Let me just uh, mention here the um, focus on the school status and how um, the different types of reopenings that different countries have employed. Um, some have partially reopened, some fully reopened, and some have been uncertain about uh, reopening. And you can see it is quite different depending on the region with the uh, blue, blocks, blue box here under the world indicating the percentage of schools that have um, rem fully opened, but you can still see by region a significant percentage of schools that remain um, uncertain or have not yet set a date for reopening. <laughs> 
Let me just elaborate a little bit further on the potential impact on education resources. And the uh, yellow line here represents the trend in available resources for education without the pandemic. And as you can see, a slight increase. But if we now factor in the impact of the pandemic, and if you factor both the share of the education budgets of governments may reduce, but also the GDP may reduce. So if you look at an actual increase in the GDP by 5% during the year, which is very unlikely as we're seeing now, but if that, just to compare it, but with a reduction in education budgets by 5%, um, you will see the yellow, uh, the um, gray line. But then also if the share of the education budget as a percentage of the GDP is maintained, you would see it fall to blue. And then the share of education budget as a percentage of GDP shrank by 5%, you'll see uh, the uh, expenditure drop to orange. So when you factor in both the um, percentage of the education budget that will come under pressure as a percentage of the fiscal space of a country, but also with the percentage of GDP, you'll see it can be quite a significant change difference. And we are very concerned about the impact then on education with this uh, change. This here just gives you a sense of across the country where, um, across the world, I'm sorry, the school closures and, um, and it is indeed quite different, sorry, quite different depending on the region and which, which regions have partially opened, remain closed or are fully open. Now, um, these graphs, and of course, you'll have access to this PowerPoint to review it in more detail, but basically it's showing that there is no correlation between the opening of schools and the trend in cases. And uh, meaning that um, the opening of schools and closures of schools does not seem to have a direct impact on or, or influence the transmission cases uh, within the community. The good news about that is indeed, the whether country should reopen schools or not is independent of its, of its impact on transmission. Let me move now into the uh, messages that we are engaging with governments and countries around our reopening schools. And based on a survey of country offices, the um, UNICEF country offices around the world, um, the key messages that uh, UNICEF has been focusing in on is the importance of planning the reopening to be sensitive to the needs of the most vulnerable children. 92% of countries uh, engaged in, in, that, um, in that part of the campaign. Um, the need to also improve learning as schools reopen. And lastly, the need to protect public finances for education based on my earlier comments. And you'll see from the bar graphs here, different regions have, have a higher percentage of uh, countries that are engaging in advocacy on reopening, but also on the key messages. In terms of how prepared country offices are uh, in reopening and how effective they have been, there are um, five different key elements of country preparedness that we feel were uh, important to, to monitor. Um, the first was around the importance of providing critical information on ski, school reopening. And that first bar graph indicates what percentage of countries had little or no action, some action, and green was took all the necessary action. So we feel it's very important to provide information on reopening and on safe operations and to ensure that they were available in the relevant languages and at school level. We second was the importance of ensuring essential services such as health and school nutrition and vaccinations were back up and running in the school. The third was sufficient mental and psychosocial support were provided. The fourth was tailored campaigns to reach girls and out of school vulnerable children. And lastly, measured measures were put in place to reduce the barriers to enrollment, meaning extremely um, poor families or those children that are living in remote locations, what percentage of countries proactively address those barriers? So as you can see, 
if you want to look at the glass as half full, it would mean that you can see if you combine the green and yellow that some actions are all necessary actions. We had a very significant proportion of countries working in this in all five areas. And then if you want to look at the challenges, the red lines indicate those uh, country, the percentage of countries that took little or no action in what we felt was a critical area of preparedness. One thing has been clear from this disruption of uh, the pandemic and um, the, one of the lessons we are drawing is building resilient education systems has been critical to ensure equitable and sustainable development, particularly during these trying times. And providing learning materials and services that are accessible to all children, including children with disabilities, is perhaps the most critical element of reaching the most vulnerable. And you'll see 50% of countries have, have taken action in that regard. And there's a call for strengthening our analysis of which children in each context are uh, disadvantaged and, and therefore require particular um, uh, efforts to reach. <clears throat> So UNICEF during this very challenging time went through four key steps. Um, before schools closed in February and March, we were issuing guidance on how and working with governments on how to uh, keep schools open and, 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 and work to, so that they would be as safe as possible. Then as schools closed, we moved into a remote learning and, and uh, supported governments and community organizations to provide remote learning opportunities through a whole range of, of uh, tools, IT enabled, radio, TV, and uh, delivering learning materials. Right now, we're in the process of supporting the school reopening process in most government uh, and countries, and you can see a range of support and tools. And then moving into the future, how do we recover and transform education systems and reimagine education, recognizing this uh, disruptive time also presents us an opportunity to rethink of education's role in communities, education's role in a child's life, and how important it is to reimagine education. So as I mentioned, the key messages on reopening schools are, we call on governments to prioritize the reopening of schools, but take all possible measures to ensure the reopening is done safely. We do recognize that school closures have very real and devastating con consequences for children, both in terms of learning loss, but also the other services that are provided at schools by schools. We recognize that without urgent action and increased investment, particularly now recognizing how challenging the time is, that a learning crisis could turn into a learning catastrophe. And when governments do decide to keep schools closed, we must all work together to provide remote learning opportunities for all children, including the, the, those most marginalized. We have issued a framework for reopening schools and it elaborates on those points I made earlier about those key messages. And which was done across many different UN agencies and the World Bank. And indeed this partnership has proven critical. The exciting uh, thing is with the, uh, with the closures of schools, but also the planning on reopening, there's been many innovations across the world, um, innovative examples um, ranging from China, Vietnam, but also across Cote d'Ivoire and Albania, many, many countries employing some very real and innovative um, examples and tools to reach all children with remote learning, but also planning the re reopening process. Now, there was a UN-wide uh, policy brief that UNICEF was also very much involved in drafting, and there were some key recommend, uh, recommendations in that policy brief. This is now United Nations wide. And here are the recommendations, which is that suppressing the transmission of the virus and plan thoroughly for sc school reopenings. It was calling on all governments to take action in that regard, again, to protect education financing to seize this opportunity to build resilient education systems. And also, as I mentioned, shall we be reimagining education and accelerate change in teaching and learning to address the long-standing learning gap and learning crisis. We have learned from this experience that um, 
One good thing, as I mentioned earlier, that there hasn't been a measurable impact on school reopenings and community transmission. So whether the schools are open or partially open, it does not seem to correlate with levels of community transmission of, of uh, COVID-19. Um, we've also learned that there is very limited or, or uh, in many in some countries, no reported child to child uh, transmission or child to adult transmission within the school context. We've also been learning that with schools open, it can provide an opportunity to positively reinforce messages regarding behavior changes and hand washing and um, this will also increase the uh, chances of successful reopening. Um, we learned that adopting flexible delivery approaches is critical um, with the planning of reopening, including, for example, teaching outside, teaching in shifts, partially reopening so that space is maximized and social distancing is possible. Staging and sequencing school reopening so that there's engagement and there's problem solving as the process is implemented has proven effective. Engagement with all stakeholders, children, youth, teachers, parents has proven absolutely a key favorable characteristic of successful reopening. And lastly, ensuring there's sufficient and flexible resources at school level to enable risk mitigation measures has proven to be also critical. Let me take this opportunity to once again thank you. Thank you for your interest in uh, in the work of UNICEF. Thank you for all that you do to uh, during this very trying trying time to continue your own learning, but also the learning of your fellow students and uh, and your respective um, schools and education systems. And um, once again, thank you. Stay safe.